Hello and welcome to this webinar, looking at the surprising factors that can make or break your team. Whilst everybody's joining, it would be wonderful to find out where you're all joining us from. So please do find the chat function and type in um, where you are, where you're joining us from, whether you're in the UK or perhaps somewhere where it's a little bit warmer and far more exotic climes. I know it's pretty cold and grey here in Cambridge in the UK. So please do let us know where you're coming from, or where you're joining us from, sorry. And we will be starting very, very shortly. Okay. Wonderful. Somebody else from Cambridge. Brilliant. So glad that you can join us. Obviously, it's very different, isn't it, on different platforms, depending on where you can actually um, start and you can write your messages. But please do join in. Thank you, Peter. Um, somebody from Thailand. A lot warmer, I should imagine, Peter. Thank you very much. Gary, hello. Rainy Dorset. Um, yes. Yes, I think it's very similar to us. You think spring's on its way and then it disappears. Wow, um, from Pretoria in South Africa, from Singapore. Hi, Phil. Um, hi, Tanisha and Chester. Caroline, I know you're up in Ely, aren't you? I love Ely. That's from such a beautiful town, city, sorry. Um, London, hello there, Cheshire. Sunny Dubai. Oh, I was in Dubai last year. My best mate lives out there and it's a wonderful place. Thank you so much for joining us. Please keep coming in. Um, it's wonderful to see you all. So for those of you um, who don't know me, my name is Joe Keeler and I'm the Managing Director here at Belbin. We're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about the surprising factors that can make or break your team. Now, we know how difficult it is to help teams work effectively. We know it's really difficult working with teams to help them really release their potential. How do we know this? Well, for the last 35 years, we have worked with teams. We've worked with marketing teams. We've worked with sales teams. We've worked with project teams. We've worked with groups that think that they're teams. We've worked with senior leadership teams. We have worked with many, many teams over 35 years. And we get to know a little bit about them, a little bit about their pain points, a bit about what actually they need to perform. How do we do this? Well, we use the Belbin teamwork, team roles framework. We use the language of Belbin for individuals and managers to be able to understand and unlock the strengths of everybody within their team. Now, I can see from all the people who are here, we have a lot of you who have already attended our Belbin accreditation course and who are already using Belbin with great impact with teams. I'm also very aware that there are some names and some people who are joining us who I know haven't had as much experience or perhaps quite unfamiliar with the Belbin framework. I know very often that we come across Belbin, or may have come across Belbin, a few years ago, perhaps early on in your career, when you went on a training course and you were introduced to the language of Belbin, you probably remember the language of complete, complete a finisher or specialist. Now, we want everybody, regardless of your knowledge of Belbin, to gain something from this webinar. We want you all to go away with at least one, hopefully more, but one um, nugget, one sort of light bulb moment that is going to help you go forward. So before we go on to these 10 surprising things um, that really are going to make or break your teams, I'm just going to do a really quick recap of the Belbin team role theory. Now, this isn't the accreditation course. This is a webinar, OK? So there's only so much depth that we can go into. But I want us all to have a relatively similar starting level, if we can. So what is Belbin? What are the Belbin team roles? Well. Many years ago, 35 years ago, Dr. Meredith Belbin and his team of researchers were asked a question. And they were asked, why do some teams work really well? And why do some teams fail? Why are some teams less great? And they spent nine years working at Henley Management College, going back and back and back, and back and analyzing all of the teams that undertook the, um, all of the research that they, they were doing. And they realized that actually, what made a successful team wasn't the intellect. It wasn't sameness. What really made those teams successful was having access to nine distinct clusters of behaviour. Nine different clusters of behaviour were needed to facilitate 
the team's performance. We call those clusters of team roles, and of them, there are team roles. We use at Belvin, this is the framework that we use about team potential to drive business. Okay, so just before we make a start, what I thought I would do is um, icebreaker time is just to see whether or not the chat really is working and just to get your viewpoints on this because I thought this was quite interesting. For those that know me, you know that I'm a little bit of a sucker for um, clickbait. I'm quite good at I love articles and I love to find out more about this subject area. And there was one thing that I found and it was um, a study in 2019, so it's before the pandemic, and it was from Forbes and is entitled America's Most Hated Office Jargon. And they surveyed N equals a thousand people who worked in the States and they said, what are your most hated phrases, your most hated often office jargon? So I'd like you just to think about that for a second, not too long, because obviously we're short of time, it's a webinar. What do you think were in the top 10 of the most disliked or the most hated, I don't like the word hate, most disliked office jargon? What do you think they may be? You know where your um, comments are, whether or not you're joining us from YouTube or from LinkedIn, it might be in a different place. Um, what, do, what would you say was on that top 10? Anybody got any feedback? All you need to do is just go on to where it says notes and then go and go on to the side. I know I was quite, well, I wasn't surprised. One of my ones is on the list, actually. I'll let you know which one it was mine. And mine was paradigm shift. Paradigm shift was one word I, I used to really, really dislike. Ah, here we go. Thank you, Chris. Reach out and I'll be there. Here, start singing. Win-win. Um, how you're doing? Um, let's stick a pin in it. I don't think I've heard that one before. Thinking outside the box, reach out, push through and win. My goodness, low hanging fruit. So glad it was there. Thank you for those. Keep writing in because I just think this is interesting anyway. But what they found was number one, come on, drum roll. And they found that synergy was number one of the most hated um, words when you're working um, in the office. Secondly, and well done, Phil, I think you had that, it was teamwork. Then we'll come back to that later. We then had touch base, raising the bar, thinking outside the box, best practice paradigm shift. I feel that I'm on an episode of W1A here at the moment, if anybody's um, seen that. So that was quite interesting, wasn't it? I was really surprised that teamwork was so high up. And then I thought about it a little bit more and I thought, well, actually, it does make sense. Because what, what is the normal experience of working with other people? That, that is, you get that sort of groan, don't you? I've got to work with others. I've got to work as a team. Because very often we're told, this is the team that you're working in. Off you go. Very often nobody spends any time with that team. And the team is expected to perform. And there's everything is how well done the team is. And nobody thought that their, their effort is actually rewarded for that. So it doesn't surprise me when I thought about it, that actually teamwork isn't something that people relish, isn't something that people enjoy doing. And that's a shame because we know how powerful teamwork is. We know that the research says that for teams and organisations to push business performance, to be successful in the future, it's the teams which are going to be the critical bit. Teams are going to be the difference between make or break. And how we use those teams and how we help those teams work more effectively is going to be a business essential. So we really do need teamwork to come far, far lower down on that list. Um, and we need to work out what it is and how can we help those teams. OK, Phil, you were shocked too. Even though you had the right answer, you were shocked. That's good. So we're going to start here. We're going to go through the list of surprises. Now, some of you will say well, that's not surprising, but hopefully some of it will be. In our experience, regardless of industry, regardless of which vertical or whatever you're on, these things come up time and time again. Number one, uncertainty. 
Teams need to have an ability to deal with uncertainty. Teams know how to deal with uncertainty. Do your teams know how to react to change, to things happening not in the planned way? Research and experience tells us that a team is more likely to be able to deal with uncertainty than an individual. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You've got more people um, to be able to share around the uncertainty. But it doesn't quite happen like that. Teams are more able to deal with uncertainty if they know which people within the teams, which behaviours are needed at that time, which behaviours are actually better at dealing with that uncertainty. Now, research says that when teams deal with uncertainty, there's three different ways that they can approach that. The first way is that they go towards process, process that's already developed. Um, and that's when you're looking for that implemented behaviour, the organised ones, the practical ones, the efficient ones, the ones who are rolling up their sleeves and just working hard. So if it's a case of change which allows you just to divert to a system, you all need to know where that implementer is within your team to be able to point out that system, to remind you of that system. The second thing is having a rule of thumb. So if things start going a bit awry, let's say, or there's uncertainty in the air, is that you have a, a set of guidelines, a set of guidelines that the team can go to and go, ah, if this happens, this is how we respond. And in that situation, you need to find that coordinator, the one who's got the broad outlook, the one who's able to take that step back, but look again at the objectives and see how as a team you can um, apply those guidelines. Or if you have a situation that we did three years ago where suddenly we're all working from home like this, the team needs to know where the shaper is needs to know where the behaviour, which is all about direction, all about speed, all about energy, all about certainty, telling people what to do and when to do it. So teams need to be able to deal with uncertainty. Not in a general sense, of we've got a team here, but they need to know within the team where they need to go to be able to deal with that uncertainty, depending on where it is at the time. Okay, what else? as a team? What else can we make or break a team? Awareness of common sense. And we hear this all the time, don't we? This is a phrase of, oh, just use your common sense. Oh, that should be easy. Yeah, just, just, just use, what do you think? Yeah, just use your common sense. The most effective teams make sure that they question this because common sense is all relative, isn't it? It all depends on your viewpoint, your background, your historical data changes the way in which you see things. You've got assumptions being made. What's common sense to one person isn't necessarily common sense to the next. And this is where great teams really come into their own is that they question it. They don't make assumptions. For those of you who have been on our accreditation course, you'll know that we have an exercise where we ask everybody within the team to get a sticky pad and write down what they think the objective of that team is. And then we get them to put them on a flip chart and then we compare and contrast. And it is incredible, the variance of language, the variance of understanding on what a lot of people thought, well, it's obvious, isn't it? That's what the objective is. No, people see things from entirely different perspectives. We also have team conversation cards we use, which are actually written by our accredited practitioners. Um, to be able to start those conversations going on, please don't make those assumptions is all I would say. Make sure that your team understands they need to question assumptions. It's also to have a lot to do with culture. And if you're moving within different teams or within different organisations, what is common sense in one area may not be common sense in another, which is another reason why we need to check our understanding. It could be that in one organisation, before you send something for a thousand print run, um, is that you do get two or three people to check it over, people with that high complete a finisher, who's got the anxiety to make sure that there are no mistakes. That's common sense in one place, but perhaps in another place, somebody's common sense is it's okay, or just send it over because the printer will deal with that. Assumptions are made. Make sure that they're, they're questioned. And the best is what the best teams do. They question, they question, and they make sure that everybody is on the same page. Fewer hands on deck. For those of you who have been on a Bellbell webinar before, you'll know that this is a little bit of a, um, an area of mine which I love. 
And this is about size of team. Now, it's not just about, oh, this isn't just a theoretical exercise, okay? This isn't a bit of academia and you know, there's research that shows that teams need to be small. You know, they need to be four, five, six. Um, why is that? Why does that matter? Well, how many times have you been in a team and you've looked around and you realise the people within the team are there because of their functional role? They're there because politically they need to be there. They're there to make up the numbers. Um, and what you find is there's a big gathering of people, more of a, a group, and nobody quite knows what their contribution is. Nobody quite dares put their hand up because to say something, to, to you know, worry about the So the fewer that, it makes sense that the more people will be engaged, the more people will feel that they can make a contribution. Now you see this all the time virtually, don't you? How many of you have been in a meeting and you've worked on emails at the same time? We're not perfect. <laughs> How many of you have been in a meeting and you've been able to see somebody's screen saving go up and you know that they're on WhatsApp? Yeah? If this is happening, and I'm sure plenty of you are doing it now, it's okay, this isn't a meeting, it's a webinar, it's kind of allowed, isn't it? But what we want to make sure is that the numbers are small enough so that doesn't happen, that everybody feels engaged. If you want some more stats, um, there's millions of them about meetings as well. Making sure that you keep your meetings small. It saves you a billion pounds a year or something. It's something like we spend 25 days a year in meetings. We may not be able to do anything about the amount of meetings, but the time spent in them, if they're smaller, we can definitely reduce that. Using the language of team roles allows you to make sure that those who are in the meetings, who are in the teams, there is a balance. And you are able to make sure that you're not putting people who are all the same together. And perhaps if you're putting all shaper behaviours together, there'll be blood on the walls because they're so driven and challenging and high energy. If you are going to have a small team, make sure you've got your team roles balanced as well. Number four, imbalance. We talk about balanced teams, but do they need to be balanced all of the time? What we're really talking about here is understanding behavioural diversity and using that for the benefit of the team and the organisation. When you're on the accreditation course, we take you through what's called the project team exercise. And this is a wonderful way of working out who is needed and when they are needed. This is so critical when it comes for teams working to their full potential. I'll give you a case study. We worked with a creative company and creative team and their idea is they used to get the brief from their client about the creative that they needed and then they would hand that over to the client. What was happening is that time spent between the finishing of a project and handing it over was getting stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched because they never... They found it hard to finish a project. They did these timelines were just going out. What does that mean? Well, we all know what that means. It means that there was more money, more man hours. Um, the client was slightly annoyed. Um, all of these things were having a knock-on effect. But the other knock-on effect was that people were becoming really disengaged. Because when they did get it over the finishing line, there wasn't a celebration. It was more of, oh my goodness, we've actually done that. Um, so having this elongation of the product was really causing them problems and they then started realizing that they were having a higher staff turnover and this kind of makes sense doesn't it they're having a higher staff turnover because nobody was engaged so what did we do we applied this whole concept of this project team exercise with them we got them to break down these creative projects into small manageable chunks different types of work then we asked them to assign the types of behavior that was needed at each point and then allocating the right person to the right behaviour, depending on their Melbourne team or strengths. What they found is at the beginning, they had a stage called ideation. And that's where the ideas came in. And that's when really they identified that they needed the plant, which is the creative, unorthodox, brilliant at problem solving um, team role. And also the resource investigator. They're the ones who have um, lots of enthusiasm, go outside the organisation, steal other people's ideas. And you needed those right at the very beginning. 
what they found was that these behaviours were also being involved during the implementation stage. And this is the problem. Because they found that the people trying to implement everything that they'd agreed on, and then somebody would go, actually, I've got another idea. We should do it like this. And then they'd go back again. And so there's a constant loop of getting somewhere, oh, something that might be a different way of doing it, and kept going again. Using the language of Belbin, understanding the behaviours that were needed at the right time, allowed those plant and resource behaviours, resource investigator behaviours, sorry, to have permission, you're giving them permission to go away. <laughs> You've come up with the ideas, please now go, go help another team, another project that's at the ideation stage. Or put a different hat on because we all have many strengths. We're not just one team role. We each of us plays about two or three of these roles really well. Take that hat off, put another one on which is going to be needed. By doing this, they managed to squidge their project timelines right down. They, sold, they saved money, but they also had a far more engaged workforce. Their um, recruitment, everything. They weren't spending money on recruitment as much. That's a massive cost saving because people were engaged in what they were doing because the right people were being used at the right time within the project. That's it, what we're talking about with imbalance. You don't need everybody involved all of the time. You need the right people at the right time. I quite like um, one of Meredith Belbin's analogies here. He talks about the stage. And we should all know when to come on the stage and come off. We all should know the parts that we play. You wouldn't expect all the players to be there at the same time. OK, dissent, conflict. Teams that we work with who embrace conflict are more successful than those that ignore it or hope that it goes away. What does this mean? Well, if you think about conflict, you've got on one side, haven't you? You've got no conflict. And to be perfectly honest, I would say that that is more or as dangerous as too much conflict on the other side, because that's when you've got group think, you've got conformity, and you've got stagnation, you've got people not daring to say yes or no, not daring to, to change the status quo. And then on the other side of the bell curve, you have um, sleeves rolled up, I suppose, at the water cooler. I don't know how to explain that. But yes, you have that, you have a more dynamic and more obvious sign of conflict. What we're looking for is for teams to sort of go in the middle, embrace conflict, know where it is, and know how to harness that conflict for the benefit of the team. On our accreditation course, this is where light bulb moments just go ding. In fact, when we work with teams and we, we explain this, this is like, oh my goodness, it now it all makes sense. Because we talk about it in Belgian team role terms. And we talk about it in terms of actually, you may have team role behaviors that are very, very different. So we've got this resource investigator behavior, the one we've talked about before, the one who's starting lots of different projects, got lots of different things on the go, always out there. And then you have the completer finisher, who's the high anxiety, make sure that everything is perfect, everything is finished, everything is complete. Oh my goodness, there can be conflict there. Can't you just start, finish one thing before you go on to the next? Oh, why do you have to keep looking at the detail? Come on, there's something to be explored here. This is where we find, actually this particular example is quite a common one within teams. The best teams say, yes, we have got different behaviours, but what we need to do is understand how to harness together how effective that they may be. So it's saying, yes, we're not going to erase that. We need all these different viewpoints. We need there to be creativity in the team, because that's what happens with um, when, when you're able to harness conflict, you get more creativity, you get different viewpoints, you get more energy happening. You need to have this. But you do that not by ignoring it, not by trying to get rid of it, but by working with the conflict and giving the teams the tools and the language that they need to be able to do that. Um, this really is such a say and I know on all of our courses especially the the accreditation I'm looking down here so I'm trying to find a stat and I can't find it because I haven't got my glasses on here they are apologies so professional as always here we go yes conflict why does it matter that we do something well if you're looking at numbers ACAS in a recent study said that managing conflict costs business the equivalent of £1,000 per person per year so that's what it means. It means days off sick. It means just people just not being engaged. There's so many things that if we leave 
conflict just there, don't manage it, we ignore it, it can have real disastrous effects. And again, you've got the recruitment costs on top of that, haven't you, when people leave? My goodness, it costs a fortune. So embrace it. That's what the best teams do. They embrace it. They find a language to talk about it. And this is what we do in that language. That's what our accredited practitioners do. Okay. Next, the odd overshare. <laughs> I overshare a fair amount. I can imagine that you'll agree with that. Okay. What does this mean? How do teams embrace? How do they make this overshare something which is productive, something that they can use. I think sometimes we have the idea of a real high-performing team is full of just really high-performing individuals who are brilliant to everything. This isn't the case. A really high-performing team is full of brilliant individuals, but each of them which knows their strengths and their weaknesses, each of which understands the role that they need to play. I use the word weaknesses there. People need to be able to talk about their weaknesses, to, to share the fact that actually, I'm very good at that. Well, I think you're better at doing that than me. We need to be able to talk openly and honestly to overshare about the weaknesses that we have. And it's hard, isn't it? Because nobody likes the word weakness. The feedback that we have from our courses and the feedback from the people who um, attend them is that the Belbin terminology really helps us here because we talk about allowable weaknesses. So each of these team roles, each of these nine clusters of behavior, each of them has strengths. Each of them also has a weakness. So if, for example, let's think about the implementer role. So the implementer role is that efficient, practical, rolling your sleeves up, getting stuff done, loves the process, loves Excel and all of the Gantt charts and that kind of thing, loves those. If they're gonna have strengths in those areas, Something's going to have to give. And so the weakness associated with the implementer is perhaps they're not so great at change. Unless they've got a process to manage the change, of course. But they don't like change for change's sake. They can be a little bit stuck in the way that they go forward. But that's okay. And it's so okay that we've changed the terminology. It's not a weakness. It's called an allowable weakness. At Belbin, we talk about strengths and allowable weaknesses. Cool, sounds good, doesn't it? You're allowed to have them. And that's what happens with the most effective teams. They allow that overshare. They allow the rest of the team to see their vulnerabilities. In a way, it's being more authentic, isn't it? And it's not about being authentic in the workplace. I love this bit. By the way, allowable weakness doesn't mean that it's an excuse. You need to be aware of it and not just say, no, I have not completed finishes. Sorry about the mistakes. OK, so it's not an excuse, but it's a way of we say that. During our um, accreditation courses, we also talk about non-allowable weaknesses, and that's when it goes a little bit too far, but we haven't got time to go into that. But a great way and language that teams can use to put their hands up and say, do you know, this is why I don't, I can't do this. Somebody else needs to do it for me. On to the next one. Seven. Individuals with a strong sense of self-preservation. What does that mean? Let's go back a second to that lovely quiz, the, the, the um, was it the America's most hated office jargon? Let's go back to that and think, why was teamwork at number two? Why was it there? One of the reasons I think it's there is because you work within the team, you have a project and suddenly it's the team that takes all the accolades it's the team that have done particularly well and it's always well done team sometimes people have made different contributions for that team to be successful but we don't always acknowledge those but we need to we find that teams that really are driving business performance are able to highlight the individuals within the team and actually acknowledge their contribution for the, for, the, for the team to be effective. People are allowed to be themselves and are allowed to say, actually, if this team is going to achieve its objectives, I need to be playing, I'll be at the very, very top of my game. And I need to be as good an example of a type. I think that was a bit of an accreditation phrase. I do apologize. What do we mean by that? Everybody within the team needs to be able to strengthen their strengths. Everybody needs to be even better at 
their, you know, in their contribution that they're making than they are at the moment. And then the team needs to harness that, but needs to acknowledge the contribution that each individual is making within that team, as opposed to always just being a general, the team did well. The team did well because, Vicky, you played an absolute blinder there. Your specialist knowledge came out just when we needed it. The team did brilliantly. Thank you so much, Jill, because you put together the process so that we all knew exactly what needed to be done. You allocated the work beautifully. You were able to do that. Thank you for doing that. We need the sense of self. The self is not being overridden by the team. This also helps the development point of view, because I've just been doing lots of one-to-ones here in the Belvin office. And one thing that we always talk about is not doing the same year every year. So, okay, I've been here 22 years. Yes, yes, I think I have. 22 years. I don't want to just have the same years of experience just repeated 22 times. I want to grow, I want to develop, and I want to explore other ways in which I can use this for the benefit of the team and the organisation. So working within a team, what we want to do is help people develop not just a strong sense of self-preservation, sense of self, to, to even strengthen that even further. To go on a training course that is based on your strengths to make you an even better shaper, coordinator, resource investor, user, whatever language that you want for the benefit of the team. Don't ever send me on a training course to become a better, completer finisher. Nobody will enjoy the experience and it won't happen. That's why we have a team. I know where Vicky is. It's okay. Okay, next slide. So I'm to keep getting distracted by the comments. I do apologise. I love your point, Phil. Just, just, just let it come out. Just do it. Show what people you're, you're capable of. I absolutely agree there. Really high performing teams, we find, have no one leader. Think about this for a second. If you've got a really high performing team, you've got people who understand the contributions that they're making. Know that it's quite small. We haven't got 25 people involved. And that's quite critical, actually. Um, if you've got people who understand what the objectives are, there's clarity, all the common sense has been um, questioned, conflict has been embraced, everybody understands the role that they are in. Why would you need one leader? Because we're not always doing the same work, are we, as in teams? Teams are fluid, they're reactive to the environment. Um, they're at different stages of the project, using the example we used earlier. So why would you expect there just to be one leader throughout? At Belbin, using the Belbin terminology, we find that the most successful teams are ones that rotate the leadership depending on where the team is at the time. What do you mean by that, Jay? Fair point. If you're right at the very beginning and you're in a fast paced environment, perhaps you're looking at problem solving, looking at different ideas, and there was energy within the team because that's what was gonna create all of these ideas. You would want somebody to lead that with the same amount of energy. So you're looking perhaps at the shaper, with the dynamism, with the, with the energy, with the drive, along with perhaps with the resource investigator who's bringing the other energy from opportunities, from knowing people from going outside. But when you're at the latter stage, where perhaps it's all about the implementation, it's all about the doing, as opposed to the thinking <laughs> and the action, um, it would be better suited for somebody else within the team to take the lead there. Somebody perhaps, perhaps more implementer, um, who's able to put the process in, more complete a finisher looking at the detail, perhaps a bit more monitor evaluator, a bit more specialist. So those roles that suit the type of the pro the place where the project is in at the time. So going back again to that project team um, idea is all of this we take you through on accreditation courses. And I'm sure those of you who've been accredited, you can really see that. Um, and this is what we're looking for, is using the team more in a dynamic sense as opposed to being in a very static sense. And this is where that no one leader comes in. For really successful teams, that needs to be rotated, depending on where the team is at the time. A healthy dose of scepticism. I love this. Successful teams know where the sceptics are. I feel like I just now leave this and go on to the next slide. Successful teams don't wait for the end of a project, halfway through a project, when money has actually been and resources have been allocated to a project for somebody to then say, I wouldn't have done it like that. 
to say, have you thought this through? Have you done? Have you done all of those questions? You need to have those questioning right at the very beginning. Now, this is difficult, isn't it? Because sometimes we don't like our ideas to be questioned, especially if we're high plant, where we have creativity and conventional thinking, and somebody's always saying, no, that won't work because. That can be quite difficult, but actually, there will be an idea that will work. But you need to make sure it's the right idea. So within a team, you need to know where those skeptics are. Now, in Melbourne team role language, we would call those the monitor evaluators. And they are the ones that make, take the emotion out of the decision making process. They weigh up the pros and the cons. They take all of that available information. And unfortunately, Lena, I know you know this as well, you've just popped up. They're always right, aren't they? They are, they're always right. So you need to make sure that you involve them. So monitor evaluators are also, so we talked about earlier, we talked about weaknesses, about oversharing. One of the allowable weaknesses of the monitor evaluator is the fact that they're not the most inspirational. And that's okay, you're not looking for inspiration, you're just looking for them to be right. But that does mean that they're not always gonna place themselves in the center of the team. It means they're more likely to take a bit of a back seat. They're more likely to have their arms crossed. They're more likely to be listening. They need to be invited in. So the skeptics need to be invited into the team at the right time. There's skepticism and there's cynicism and there's negativity. So you have to make sure that we are dealing with the people who are skeptical, who are the monitor evaluators. There is a difference. I'm just going to put my glasses on here because I love this. I've just stolen this because I am a high resource investigator from the website of um, Matt Suma, who is our distributor in Estonia, because we do have distributors around the world. We have our accreditation courses in many different languages and countries. And here is their way of checking that you are dealing with a monitor evaluator. So if your enthusiastic cry of I have an idea is received with thoughtful nodding, then 10 tough questions on how it will work, how much it will cost and whether or not it has already been done. That's where somebody's doing a good job as a monitor evaluator. On the other hand, if your suggestion is met with no, that won't work. Oh, no, it won't work. Well, why are you bothering with that? No, it won't work, I tell you. Um, you're dealing with a pessimist. That is not a good example of a monitor evaluator. We need to make sure <laughs> that you're using the monitor evaluator within the team, not just the negative ninny, as my grandma used to say. So we know that really successful teams embrace the skeptic. They embrace the monitor evaluator behavior. We know this. And um, with using the team role framework and the language and the understanding of this really does enable the teams to work better together. Number 10, the last on the list, the opportunity to mess around or have fun. This is a difficult one for me, I have to say, um, because I was brought up, my dad always used to say that actually you're not there to have fun, Joe. why are you enjoying work? You're not there, to, you're there to work, you're not in there to enjoy yourself. Not I know, fair point, a bit old school perhaps. But then recently I've had the opportunity to think about that. And my dad, he worked for British Gas, he was a, a, an engineer, into little gas van. And actually they had five aside um, tournaments all the time of other people who worked in, in gas, who are other gas engineers. They actually had five aside footballs. They used to go away for days and weekends and they would play football together. I was actually invited and went on a couple of those um, tournaments. That was interesting. Anyway, what I'm saying is that although he said that, that wasn't actually true because his team of people who are doing a similar job they spent time outside of work and they enjoyed that time. I think my grandma was actually also part of the darts team, but then, you know, you don't need to know my family history. What we're saying is that if you have a team, allow them the space, allow them the time to develop and understand what is it that they have in common that they can take, not necessarily outside of work what is it that they can enjoy together that doesn't involve spreadsheets and answering the phone and everything else they're doing because if you have that you develop far more what we call psychological safety far more trust you're more likely to have each other's backs um, and therefore you're going to be more successful as a team it's so important that we do this 
but please, if there's any managers on this call, don't enforce the fun. Don't tell everybody this is what fun looks like, this is what messing around looks like, because that doesn't work. We find that teams who find this organically, they're given the space to find this out. That's really where it comes from. And if you're not too sure what that is, find the team worker in your team, the high team worker, the one with empathy, listening skills, the one that knows everything about everybody. So I bet they'll be able to tell you where those um, similarities are, what perhaps you could do to boost team morale. Wow, that was a lot of talking, wasn't it? So in summary, there are so many things that make or break a team. Some of those things are more surprising than others. We need teams because they are critical at being the successful component of your organization's future. But we need to work at it because teamwork is hard. It's rare, but it's so, so powerful. And it would be lovely to get that teamwork further down the list of those hated phrases. So what have we done? We've talked about uncertainty, a wariness of common sense, fewer hands on deck, imbalance, dissent, the odd overshare, individuals with a strong sense of self-preservation, the fact that you need no one leader. You always need a healthy dose of scepticism and those teams need to be able to give them the opportunity to have fun, to mess around. After this webinar, we will be sending you information about our Belbin accreditation course so that you can implement this framework of Belbin to be able to help your teams unlock their potential, to help managers, that helps you become a better manager, a better leader, to be able to understand, identify, and use the strengths of everybody within the team using that Belbin framework. But before we do that, we have some time for questions. And because I've been talking at you for the last 42 minutes, looking at my clock here, I've invited Victoria Brown to come and join me for this last part. Now, I don't know if many of you know Victoria, but she's our head of research and development. And she's also helped co-author Dr. Meredith Melbourne's um, book, Team Roles at Work, the third edition. We've got a whole chapter on the back now about virtual teams and how teams work. Come on, you can't get on the camera. Come on, come on, come in here quickly. So we've got about 10, 15 minutes now to be able to answer any of the questions that you have had. Vicky, you've been watching all the questions coming in. This is a new platform for us, so we're not entirely sure how it works, but it's working. Yes. Um, Anything in particular? <laughs> yeah, apologies. We have had a few technical issues with LinkedIn, but I think we're working okay now. Um, Yes, yeah, interesting. Um, Campbell, uh, Campbell Urquhart, so um, one of his favourites, the team that plays together stays together, just in response to oh, what you are yes. talking about. No, I like which I think that. Is, uh, is really valuable, but as you say, not sort of forcing that to happen, which I think is. Well, I know how many people have been talking, we've got to do this. It's more like a, you will have fun. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Nadalina says another reason why teamwork is perhaps unpopular is that sort of. Forcing it, isn't it? It I is. Suppose. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we had quite a few good responses. People, um, my door is always open, I suppose, that you we were asking for phrases at the beginning of. Yes. Um, and let's not boil the ocean. You know, these sort of oh, I haven't heard that one. Let's projects. not boil the ocean. <laughs> right, let's see if we can get that into a blog. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I think something else that's coming through is all that scepticism, cynicism. There is a difference. Um, again, when we're talking about the monitor evaluator behaviour, we want them to be sceptical. But if it goes into cynicism and they become more cynical, that's when those allowable weaknesses might turn into a non-allowable weakness start happening. The more you understand the language of Belbin and the framework and how to use it, the more powerful it becomes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I'm just looking here as well. Um, someone's been talking about managing people and, and that kind of frustration mm. that can crop up and I think one of the, the key things that Belvin can do is to sort of help that relationship between managers and their team because we know don't we that that's such a key factor Absolutely. engagement and in retention um, it is that that relationship so well it's an interesting one isn't it is that I can't remember what the phrase is but uh, it's something like always treat others how you would like to be treated and that's as a manager. So, well, I'm going to manage you like this because that's how I would like to be managed. But actually, if you think about it, if I managed everybody how I want to be managed, I just imagine there'd be tears by the end of the day. <laughs> um, I need to know how 
other people want to be managed and I need to appreciate the difference. We're talking about diversity earlier and um, behavioural diversity. Under the framework of the language development allows actually, if I'm managing so-and-so who is a shaper, um, coordinator, resource investigator, how am I going to get the best out of them? Yes. And that critical difference, isn't it? Language and get Yeah. Uh, back in. We were talking that we talk about in team lots at work. Yes, it? it is. Um, and it's difficult. I think there were very different situations um, from the beginning of the pandemic and taking established teams online. That's quite a different proposition to building a team remotely that's never met in person, isn't it? No, it is. Um, I can't remember the research, and we have to be careful here because between us, we could just go into a research sort of line, just get down into a hole there. It says that teams need to have met at least once face to face for them to start developing those relationships. So it's important to find the budget, to find the time, and everybody's incredibly busy schedules, is to get people to just, just have a drink with somebody at the bar, um, enjoy somebody else's company outside of a rectangle. And that is going to make sure that a team is more effective, most definitely. I would say, actually, <laughs> during the pandemic and having virtual and hybrid teams has caused difficulties, especially on the whole common sense business, because um, we're not so explicit, are we, with what the rules are within the team and how we do things. Yeah. And that's caused problems. And I know we talk a lot about recontracting with teams, don't we? We do. Yeah, yeah, it's something that does come up a lot. So it takes more work when people are virtual or hybrid. It can still be a very, very successful team, and there are many of them, but it's being a bit more conscious about not taking yes. things for granted. Yeah, and I think also knowing, like you were saying with uncertainty earlier, mm. knowing, you know, some of your team might be really comfortable working from home, um, you know, and that, that might, of course, there are a number of factors that can influence that, but you might be, there might be some people who prefer working in solitary, others who really need that social interaction yeah. and want the buzz of mm -hmm. being, you know, with people in person. So it's another, it's it's a tool, isn't it? That yes. You can use, um, that's really valuable for managers. Oh, look, Beverly, I'm, I'm feeling your pain. So Beverly's just written in here that she often finds herself a completer finisher in having to do the role of resource investigator in order to get the papers properly completed and on time. But it's exhausting. No funding for recruitment. What do you do? My goodness. Um, well, after you've wiped your tears, and because I understand, because I'm also a really high resource investigator, really low um, completer finisher, it's a difficult one. But I think acknowledging that is actually the first step of knowing that you're not playing to your strength. When you're on our accreditation course, you learn about something called team or strain. And that's when we play out of role um, for too long. And after a while, we do hit burnout. And it's something that we really do need to address. No funding to recruit. What do you do? Do you need to recruit somebody full time or can you perhaps outsource as and when you need it? Maybe there's other people in other teams who are playing the resource investigator role, but actually they're really, really high completer finisher. One thing we've found, actually, is when organisations really embrace the language of team roles and they use it throughout the organisation, people don't feel so isolated because they know the strengths of everybody. And they go, I'm just going to steal so-and-so from so-and-so department because they're bringing something to our team that we don't need all the time, but we need right now. So that might be an idea. Or a good apprentice, that's a good idea, Jane, isn't it? Um, there's so many um, elements here. And um, we need to flex, we do feel, absolutely. Yeah. And we need to know how each team will, each of us, um, we pressure. Do you know, there's so many things we need to know. There's so much that we need to know to make sure that our teams are effective. But do you know what it starts with? It starts with understanding and having a language to talk about difference. Because until you have that shared language, that shared understanding, it's really hard to have the conversations talking about pressure. It's really hard to have the conversations talking about playing out of role. It's really hard to have those conversations about conflict. Using the Belvin model really allows you to do that. And to do it properly, obviously, when you go on the accreditation course, we give you um, that insight, that depth of knowledge that you will need 
to understand and to help teams use that language effectively and to flex accordingly. Okay, sorry, I'm just reading. I'm so <laughs> awful, isn't it, when you get distracted? <laughs> one second. Okay. And remember that none of the one thing, um, I think somebody said something a little bit here, is that it's about saying, like, what does the team need? And this is where sort of Bell is from, from others. This is what does the team need to hit its Just Breaking that down, what behaviours are they needed? What are the people that are needed? We're not talking about what does that person need. We're starting from a different viewpoint. So we don't like to label people, you are a shaper. At the moment, we need your shaper behaviour. But we know that you have other behaviours as well um, that you can use and develop. And I think that's quite an interesting and quite useful distinction. Okay. And part of the sort of development opportunities that we were talking about earlier, isn't it? So another sort of avenue when you know what people's strengths are, but you know what their potential is and the, the areas that they want to sort of move into. That's yeah. A, that's a great sort of um, that's a great piece of knowledge for yeah. a manager to have. Isn't it just absolutely? Okay. I love the idea of leadership emerging based on the need rather than having a status. Yes, and yes. Leadership shouldn't be some sort of state of something that's done. <laughs> um, leaders here, everybody else here, it should be something that is organic and is ref reflects the needs of the team at the time. Absolutely. And if that team has got that level of trust, um, I've forgotten the word now. Psychological Thank you, psychological <laughs> safety. If it has that, it's more likely to happen. If people really have the understanding of the team, that's when it's more likely to happen. We talk like this, and yeah, you need that. These all take work, they all take time. You need an understanding of a framework um, to be able to do that. We've got another question from LinkedIn. How robust is an individual's team role? Does it change sporadically or depending on the environment of the project? Oh, <laughs> lovely question. Do your team roles change? Well, yes, they do. As we're measuring behavior, this isn't personality, this isn't who am I. It's it's what I do, isn't it? What you contribute. What you contribute. And um, so from that respect, it's behaviour and you expect it to change depending on experiences, different teams, different organisations, life. Um, all of these, your changing values, your motivations, all of these will have an impact on the way that you behave. So you would therefore expect them to behave and um, to change. But when we talk about the needs of the team, you need to be able to flex, don't you, to be able to meet those needs as well. Each of us has about two or three roles we can play really, really well. Two or three roles we can manage and two or three roles we really need to delegate. Um, these will change, not massively, but they will change, won't they? Over time. Over yeah, time. As you say, you don't expect to see a complete reverse. No. There might be things that you find difficult that that's always the case, but yeah. Absolutely. We can adapt, can't we? We are adaptable, as we will see. <laughs> I've just realised that what we're doing now is talking to you generally about all of the questions, which have been so many, so many interactions. And actually, this isn't, I don't know if it's any a brilliant use of, of anybody's time. So please do go on our website. Please do get in touch, team at belvin.com, if you have any particular questions. Like I said, we'll be sending you the information of the accreditation course so that you can learn more about how to use the Belvin framework with your teams to make you um, a more effective manager, leader, uh, whatever your capacity um, is we'll send you some more information about the theory itself and have a good look around our website Vicky has written some amazing articles um, looking at all elements of teamwork teamwork is rare it's hard we need to keep working at it at Belbin we feel that the language of the team roles empowers your teams to be the best they possibly can be thank you so much for joining us please do keep in touch Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.